Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us begin with Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. drive according to the speed limits, we have to follow the laws of society, and we have laws that are given in the Bible that are to help us uh, live with God and according to God's love. And you all have some rules to follow in your lives, like brush your teeth so you have good hygiene or wash your hands. Like now we really understand with the virus why it's so important to wash our hands before meals or often throughout the day not to put sand in your mouth, don't eat the dirt. We have all sorts of cleanliness, hygiene laws. But sometimes you kids may hear adults or other kids that they've, uh, kids say things that they've heard from adults, uh, repeat things that tell you that God doesn't like this person or that the Bible gives this rule and, and it's against that person or against that behavior. And I want you all to know that the Bible from cover to cover and the teachings of Jesus always teach us how to love. Everyone is loved by God. If you ever hear someone teach you that God doesn't love this person or this person's not good enough for God, I want you to talk to somebody that you trust. And maybe it would be me or a teacher or a coach or your friend's parent. But I want you all to know that if something ever doesn't feel right to you, someone's doing something to you and they say, well, they're doing this out of love. Or you know they're doing it to someone else and they're saying, well, this is loving. But it just doesn't seem right or loving to you. 
I want you to know that God is always love, and Jesus is always love, and we are always to love, and love makes us feel good, not bad. So bless you kids in following the rules that you're taught, but remembering that if anything's ever done in the name of God or according to the Bible and it doesn't feel like love to you, then there's some misunderstanding. God bless you kids. Our scripture reading today is a selected group of verses from the book of Leviticus. Listen for the word of God. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do, so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. I am the Lord who brought you out of slavery to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are going to come to our prayers of the people now. And for our prayers on this very important week in the life of our country, we have our inauguration coming up. And with all that's going on in our divisive world, our prayer today uh, will be the song, Help Us Accept Each Other. And so I encourage us to let these words fill our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our plans, our actions, our desires. Let us pray, help us accept each other. to convey to anyone who hears this message from your word and get our egos out of the way, get our self-deceptions and misunderstandings, misguided thinking, things that we've been taught that are not of you out of the way so that we hear directly from your divine spirit and you speak to each person uniquely according to what they need to hear. And you let anything that's not helpful, that doesn't draw people closer to you, to fall away and not be a distraction. Speak, O oh Lord, so that we may be more faithful 
I pray in the name of Jesus and by his power. Amen. I had begun a new call as a pastor in a new church, and the, one of the very first Sundays in Bible study, I was teaching on the Gospel of Mark, and somebody suddenly interrupted off topic and said, isn't it true that the Bible says homosexuality is an abomination? And I don't know if you've have ever had this feeling that terror shoots through your body. I was in a conservative church. I knew that what I had been taught about the meaning of scripture, the context of scripture, the understanding of God's truth was different than probably what these 20 people around the table had been taught. And the tone of voice with which that question was asked, I almost felt like it was a gotcha question, like trying to trip me up and catch me and cause division in the group. And my whole body went into this high stress alert. And I started praying silently before I answered, God help me, God help me, God speak, God give the right answer, God speak to these people that are here. Before I could even answer, because the Bible in Leviticus does say that a male lying with a male is an abomination. A 92 year old woman at the other end of the table spoke up and she said, I've learned so much from the people in my life who are gay and from our conversations and what they share with me. And the person who had asked the question said, well, who do you know who's gay? I don't know anyone who's gay. And the 92 year old said, you know the same people that I do. And the first person said, well, I don't know anyone. No one's ever told me they're gay. Well, tell me who they are. And you could feel the tension around the table. You could feel the angst and the wondering what was going to be said yet next and where was I going to come in as the new pastor weighing in on this challenging topic. And the 92-year-old woman who was very well respected, she was an elder, um, a community leader, a beloved, gentle, faithful Christ follower. She said, well, it's my observation that people tend to speak to those with whom they feel safe. They're willing to be vulnerable when they know they're unconditionally loved and nothing will change uh, the person's love for them. And I went on with the gospel teaching about Christ's love and that topic came up various other times. I offered to teach a Bible study on it. I had parents of gay children who came out come and ask me if I could please have meetings with their children and explain to them that if they live a gay lifestyle, they'll be going to hell for all eternity and they'll be cut off from anyone they've ever known or loved. And I would always say to the parents, I'm more than happy to meet with your children. I will meet with them and I will teach them about uh, God's truth in the Bible and about God's love for them and God's love for all of us. And God's grace was certainly upon us in that challenging time, but I can say that that church and every church I've served has always come to be more trusting in God's love and less divisive and exclusive than it began when I arrived. You all know that I'm not an activist. I am a Christ follower. I am a believer in God's word. I am a lover of God's truth and I want my light to be a light light and I want our church to be a light and I want all people who know and love Jesus and know that they're loved to be a light this book of Leviticus that we are on today is one of the most challenging books for many people because it has these laws these rules that can be confusing and they're very detailed and they can get people off track, people who want to cherry pick verses that they use and that they use to exclude people. So let's look at some of these challenging verses. As I conclude that by saying, 
Jesus had every opportunity to speak against homosexuality, and he never did. He spoke against divorce, he spoke against adultery, he spoke about um, things that we eat and how to love, but he did not choose to speak and to um, fulfill that line in Leviticus or other Old Testament lines, but he did repeat the line from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. And he did change the line, be holy as I am holy, to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But it is in Leviticus, in these 27 chapters, that we get these lines, these verses, these laws, like don't have tattoos, don't cut your body, don't wear clothes that have more than one material in them. This is where we hear against a prohibition against mixed breeding of animals or mixed seeding of fields. This is where we're told not to take the Lord's name in vain. This is where we're told that anyone who commits adultery, both parties should be put to death unless the adultery is with your neighbor's slave. Then death is not the consequence. This is where we are told no wine in worship. And we're told that anyone who curses their mother or father should receive death as the penalty. This is also where we're told that some things are clean and some things are unclean, particularly to do with sexual laws and to do with eating laws, the cleanliness, the purity code. It's where we get kosher food. And so the whole chapter 11 of Leviticus tells us that you can only eat animals who have a divided hoof and who chew their cud, which excludes pigs as well as other animals. It's where we're given a list of um, birds, flying creatures that are acceptable to eat and those that are not. It's where the Israelites were told that they could only eat things of the sea that had fins and scales, which excludes all shellfish. So no more lobster or shrimp or oysters or clams. And it's where a list is given of acceptable insects, only those whose legs have joints, which basically is grasshoppers and crickets and locusts. It's also where the value of worshiping in the temple is um, stressed and the laws given to worship and how to handle things around worship, to give 10% to God, to consecrate, dedicate 10% of our offerings to God. And it's where we are told, love your neighbor as yourself, which is repeated in 1 Peter and the Gospel of Luke and Galatians and Romans. So we have these interesting teachings, uh, and people get bogged down in this book. It's probably the least read book in the Bible because it can be so out of context for us today, and the rules can be so specific and contextual. And yet, overall, it's a really uh, important book in the, the teaching of God's law because it is the new normal for Yahweh, for God, to be publicly um, living with human beings. That hadn't happened since the Garden of Eden. And then people messed it up with the help of the evil serpent. So God is wanting his people, the Israelites, to get it right this time so that they can live together, God present with God's people. And the book of Exodus before this, we heard last week, was about God with uh, his teachings on a cosmic scale. But now we have in Leviticus, God in very fine detail, daily living issues. Kathleen Norris, the great writer, wrote in her book, Laundry, Liturgy, and Women's Work. Many readers see the attention to detail in Leviticus as ludicrous. And she said, because God is including laws for the minutia of daily life, the preparing, the cooking, the cleaning up 
of meals and of food. But what, Nora says, if we revision God's attention to detail as the very love of God for humanity, a God who cares so much that God desires to be present in everything we do. That's the teaching of Leviticus, my friends. The power of God's love and God's presence, the importance of priests and worship, and all those who are leading others in worship, who are close to the divine. There are regulations around that so that we take tremendous care and attention to our work. I recommend a book for all of you to read. It's called The Buddhist on Death Row by David Sheff. It is a book to me that Christ is on every page. God's presence, just like God was in the details of the Israelites' life that we hear about in Leviticus, God is present, Christ is present in this story, the true story of a man named Jarvis Masters who has been on death row at San Quentin since 1990 for a crime that he was framed for, killing a guard. And yet, as the tagline of the book says, how one man found light in the darkest place, he is bringing light to the darkest places and darkest hearts of the world. He is having a huge positive impact. That is the power of Christ in our midst and our looking to God and trying to be obedient to God's laws. So yes, some of these laws in the Old Testament certainly, and in Leviticus, certainly aren't part of our context today. And I certainly believe and understand that God is not telling us that it's our place to tell others who to love, who is acceptable to love. God's not telling us now that what animals we can eat or can't eat. God is wanting us to have rules around sexual behavior and eating behavior and communal life that benefits society, that benefits each person and benefits relationships. And the teaching of the Bible from cover to cover, my friends, is always that love is the answer. Love is the way. Not things that are wrapped in the words that this is loving, well, I have to do this because this is most loving to keep them from going to hell, or I have to do this, this father is abusing a child, or this uncle is involved in incest, or there's sex trafficking, or there's pornography, or there are all sorts of things that are happening, or we're being difficult when we're a dinner guest at someone's house because we are going to stand on our vegan principles. We are taught in the Bible that love, just because it's wrapped, actions just because they're wrapped in the words that they're loving, don't always mean they're loving. But we in our gut, in our hearts, we know what's loving. And the Bible teaches us to love. And, and that is the truth for all of us. Leviticus, the third book in the Old Testament, in what's called the Hebrew Torah or the Greek Pentateuch, is the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. And it's the law of Moses because it happens at Mount Sinai. Remember we ended Exodus last week at Mount Sinai? But from Exodus chapter 19 to the next book after Leviticus, Numbers chapter 10, there is no geographical movement. The location is Mount Sinai because they're on their way to the promised land. They're not there, but Moses is the key actor, human being in this book. He's getting the directions from God. And that's why it's the Mosaic Law, trying to learn from God how society can work harmoniously and can be safe and protect all citizens. And, and so we have this book, we have this location at Mount Sinai, and we have um, the Mosaic Law, which is teaching the holy people, God's people, is teaching about the holy place, the tabernacle, the temple, the place of worship, and is teaching about the holy priests, those who are serving God. That's the structure of the book. And there are 613 Levitical laws, um, Jewish commandments that we hear about. And most people, if you ask them what they know of Leviticus, all they would say is there are all these obscure laws. But look at the key one that we got, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Look at the other key one that we got. Be holy as I am holy, God says. And look at the other one that we got, which is God is the Lord our God. So we are called to consecrate ourselves to God so that we can see the glory of the Lord. When was the last time you felt like you beheld the glory of the Lord? You, you enjoyed the Lord. You shared the Lord. You were aware of the Lord's presence because that is our calling. So I want to um, say something about eating in today's world. So we, most of us Christians, we don't follow these laws. We eat bacon and, and we do other things. But there is a whole movement, as you know, toward plant-based eating. And it makes me think about Genesis 1, 29 and 30, when God said, I have given humans and all animals and all beasts and all birds and all living creatures plants to eat. And God created the vegetation and God declared it very, very good. We also hear about the peaceable kingdom in Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, where all creatures will live together, not eating each other, but those that are living, we will live in peace together in God's kingdom. There is a report in the Food and Climate Journal called PNAS, which stands for Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, that says if we all went plant-based, the emissions in the world would drop by 70% by 2050, and costs would be lowered by $600 billion. One of the greatest things we can do for the safety of the planet is to change to a plant-based diet. Now, I know many of you aren't going to do that, but it's something to look into if we want to see what God is saying to us today about laws around eating, if we want to understand what is best for the planet and for ourselves. And we have somebody in our very backyard here in Pepper Pike, the Esselstyn family and the Hart family, that are leaders in this plant-based movement. Many of you probably know them. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn from the Cleveland Clinic and his wife, Ann Esselstyn, and her grandfather, Dr. Kryle, who um, was one of the founders of the clinic. They have been leaders in this. Dr. Esselstyn, has, he's known, he goes by Essie, wrote the, the book, Pre How to Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which has been life-changing for so many people. And their four kids, Rip, Jane, Ted, and Zeb, many of you may know them, and Jane's kids, the Hart family, Kryle and Bainan and Zeb, because they're, they're all world-class swimmers. But Rip has started the Engine 2 movement uh, because he was a world-class triathlete and a firefighter and he saw the positive benefits on those around him when he influenced them to go plant-based as his family has always been so if you want to learn more about this movement you can google the Esselstyns Jane Esselstyn or uh, Rip Esselstyn or plant stock, which is their take on Woodstock at their family farm every summer, or Engine 2 diet, or any of these things. If you've seen the documentary Forks Over Knives, that was filmed at their family farm. But it, it's a fantastic resource for us to apply today. What is God saying to us? How to help our planet, how to help our bodies, how to help each other. And in terms of sexuality, what can we do to make our society and our world more healthy? Stop sex trafficking, stop the sex industry where people are abused, and stay faithful to the ones that we commit ourselves to. We don't believe in putting adulterers to death, but we also don't support slavery like Leviticus did. We also don't think it's okay for landowners to go and sleep with whatever slave they want to. My friends, there are consequences, and we want to be people who see the glory of the Lord and who make the world a better place. So when we think of Leviticus, I want you to know that the three main themes are about priests, are about atonement, and about cleanliness, holiness. 
priests because the tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe and they were the, the preachers, the worship leaders, the musicians, the gatekeepers, the guardians. They were kind of like our elders today, our property committee, our worship and music committee. And so they had specific regulations that God was giving them. And then we know Jesus, once Jesus came to earth, he became the high priest. The priests were the intermediaries between God and people in Leviticus. But Jesus became that intermediary, the, the one who forgives us. And then in our Protestant understanding, we have the priesthood of all believers. So we don't, have an inter, we don't need to have an intermediary priest or pastor. We can pray directly to God. We can pray directly to Jesus. So understand the importance that priests, that worship leaders were given, but ultimately Jesus is the one that we worship. And number two, the concept of atonement, at one minute with God. That's why we have all these rules about sacrifice and the blood of animals. Blood was sacred. That's why we talk about the blood of Jesus, because Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice. And so we've never had to sacrifice animals on an altar anymore. We don't value that. But that was their way back in Levit the time of Leviticus when they were saying, God, this is how important you are to me. I will give you my best um, animal that has, has nothing wrong with it, has no blemishes. The Day of Atonement once a year when Aaron had to go, uh, Moses' brother had to put his hand on the animal on the altar and confess all the sins of Israel in order to receive forgiveness. So sacrificial laws then were seen as drawing people closer to God. Our sacrifice sacrifices today are things like we choose not to be unfaithful to our partner. That's a sacrifice we make to be closer to God, to be faithful to God. Maybe we choose, like my family's trying to do, not to eat and kill animals and, and hurt animals, especially contribute to the slaughterhouses and to the hormones and all the things that they're pumped full of just so that we can enjoy our cheese or our meat. Those are the sacrifices we make to be closer to God? What are the sacrifices that you make to maintain your faithfulness to God, your heart that's open and pure and holy? And the third theme, the holiness, the cleanliness. Anything is holy if it's of God. So love is always holy. And things that are not of God are not holy. But where we see the contrast between Leviticus and now is they used to push people out who were seen as unclean. They separated them. So women at a time each month, got separated. You know, we see this with people that we incarcerate. We separate them. We see this with refugees and settlement camps. We separate them as unclean. We may not use those words, but that's what we're doing. But God, by God's grace, by God's mercy, by God's hand, makes all things clean if we will consecrate ourselves to God and we want to be more faithful. So let me close with this. Just as that 92-year-old in my class came to the rescue and spoke up and changed the whole dynamic in that church, the next week, an 80-year-old man came through the line and he said, is it true that we have to be perfect like our Father in Heaven is perfect? Does the Bible really say that? That's not possible. Why would the Bible say that? And I felt I was just getting this attack after worship. And I had a conversation later with him. I said, yes. We are called to be perfect. Just like in Leviticus, we're called to be holy. Jesus said we're called to be perfect. Not because we're perfect on our own, but because by the grace of God, the love of God, we can give ourselves and try to be obedient to God's teachings of love that make society more harmonious and make our lives more peaceful and our relationships more healthy. So how do we pick and choose what verses to follow? Measure everything by love. Love for God, love for self, self-care, love for others, love for all of creation. And if we know that all of creation is loved by God, that enables us to behold God in all things, to glorify God at all times, and to enjoy God every moment and for all eternity. That's the story of the Bible. That's how we make sense of all the plots, or the regulations, or the characters, or the storylines in the Bible, the persons and the places. And when we look through the eyes of love, God's love for us, 
and our love for others, love your neighbor as yourself, it says in Leviticus. Be holy as God is holy, by the hand and the grace of God. Then that informs the deepest context for the biblical doctrines that, by which we try to live. May God bless us all as we further love in the world. Let us now listen to holiness. It's what I long for. desiring to be holy, holy in the likeness of Jesus Christ, who acts out of love and care and compassion and in service to all people. May God bless you as you give your time, your talents, and your treasures to further love in the world. And may God bless our church and all churches who are being God's light for Christ's love wherever we are. And now go forth with the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God's divine spirit upon you and upon every person upon whom you look this day and forever and ever. Amen.
Oh, 